Hello, bosses. I'm super excited this week because you get a bonus episode. So last month, I was fortunate enough to moderate a panel of amazing indie authors. It was part of the Arts and Culture series held at the Vault Theater in downtown Hillsboro in Oregon and was hosted by Bags and Baggage Productions. So the authors on the panel were Catherine Fredericks, Marie Robinson, Tanya Macalino and Brian C. Palmer. And just to give you a little bit, you know, you're about to hear the panel and their answers and questions and all the things about indie authors um, and their experiences as indie authors. And it was super duper fun. So let me just give you a little bit of background. Catherine has written a variation of Pride and Prejudice. Marie Robinson writes Reverse Harem, Fantasy, Tanya Macalino writes young adult fiction, and Brian Palmer writes urban fantasy as B.C. Palmer. Now, he might sound familiar because he is also the gentleman that I interviewed this week, so you will get to deep dive into his episode if you listen to both of these. So, thank you. I hope you are excited, as excited for this as I am, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now, on to the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hey, boss. If you are starting on your author journey but are nervous about marketing, then I've got something special for you. I've just released a book called Start Marketing Your Book. (laughs) In it, I share fundamental marketing principles and simple, actionable steps that you can take right now. For less than a cup of coffee, you could actually have everything you need to start selling more books. To buy the book, go to authorlikeaboss.com forward slash start marketing. I'm very excited to be here. So I wanted to start just quickly asking a little bit about you guys. Thank you. <laughs> so who here has written a book? Wow. Nice. Awesome. And who here has thought about writing a book or wants to write a book? <laughs> okay. So and who here is a reader? Hopefully. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. So we are really, really lucky to be here tonight because we have these amazing indie authors. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's not nothing to go through the process, and we're really fortunate. So we're going to start um, with finding out a little bit about where they started, how they got to where they're at now, and then um, and then just kind of go through there talking about the difference between indie publishing, traditional publishing, and um, how they got there and why, why they did one or the other, and what they like. So I would like to start with Brian. Can you tell us a little bit about your author journey? Like, we know now what you're writing now, but can you tell us kind of where you started and um, how did you end up here? Uh, there you go. This is the thing right here. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I started. I started in uh, romance early on because when I first got into the author sort of community, the, those were the authors that, that immediately sort of took me in and, and cradled me close like a little baby author. <laughs> and, uh, and they all wrote romance, and uh, it was a great place to start really, ex- all romance is very character driven. So all of my fiction now, in, now that I've sort of moved out of romance, is very character focused, and that's because of all of these wonderful romance authors. Uh, I have wanted to write since I was a kid, and I've been writing fan fiction and uh, writing uh, really terrible stories since I was like 15, 15 years old. And uh, about four years ago, four or five years ago, the, the well, four years ago when I turned 30, uh, January 31st of that year, uh, I published my first romance and then uh, didn't touch my computer or look at the internet for like three months while I waited to find out uh, just how bad it was and, uh, and all of the terrible reviews and things like that. And to my uh, shock, my, my complete shock, 
uh, it sold really well and paid me some money. And then I thought, well, I should do this again. <laughs> <laughs> and then keep doing it. And then and then keep doing it. And four years later, here I am, still still doing it. And that's 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 the uh, it's just you you just have to leap off the cliff eventually. And that's what I did. I see that Cassie is not like, Cassie. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit how you got started? Uh, Brian, actually. <laughs> um, I was moonlighting as a bartender a few nights a week over at the Venetian, just down the street. And uh, Brian and I got to know each other because you know Scott uh, had the bag and baggage working out of the theater there before they had this wonderful space. And so, you know, Brian, being supportive and encouraged as he was, was there oftentimes during rehearsals and during shows, and so we'd be chatting and um, when he knew that the Venetian was closing down, he approached me and talked about you know, this possibility of being a writer. And unbeknownst to him, I had been writing poetry and short stories and such since I was in like first or second grade. Because being a very introverted person, which I think many writers are, that was my way of processing my emotions and you know figuring things out for myself through my writing. So uh, when he mentioned that, I was super excited and gleeful. I didn't want to come across that way, but. <laughs> I was like, sure, yeah, I'll think about that. <laughs> Dying inside. Um, so he uh, introduced me to some people that he had known in the work in the world of ghostwriting, and I put out my first uh, sample, and that seemed to go over well. And I got contracted for about eighteen months or so, pretty quickly, uh, to write novels for other authors. So they would send me a plot or an idea, and then I would generate the book, send it to them as a first draft, and they would edit it and put it out there. I ended up uh, going to a conference of a lot of self-published writers and sort of discovered, you know, it, it's not you know, one, two, three, your book is out there. There's there are steps to it, but I realized that it's definitely doable and it's it's accessible to put your own work out there. And I decided that if I was going to be doing the work of writing this novel, then I wanted it to be my novel and I wanted to have my own creative license to, to explore what I wanted to explore rather than writing for somebody else. So I took the leap and wrote my first book, and four months later, here I am. Wow. Awesome. Um, I know, Brie, that you have a story <laughs> about how you became an indie author. I do have a story. So I was like Brian, uh, that when I was young, I was writing really bad stories. I think I remember, actually, no, I have this distinct memory of when I was about four or five, writing a really bad version of the nativity story for one of my grandmother's young students. Mm -hmm. And basically, I've always wanted to be a writer. And then after that, I started writing, uh, retelling Three Little Pigs in first grade. And eventually, I moved on to trying to imitate my favorite writers, such as like Mercedes Lackey. She's a fantasy novelist that was really big in the 90s, and now I was like, okay, I've always wanted to write, I want to write. I never, it was really scary to write. Writing is very scary, it's a part of you, and that's what makes it so scary to jump out there. And so instead of writing, I went to culinary school. <laughs> and I was like, bye! And, and so I actually ended up being a baker for years. I worked as a pastry chef. I opened up one of the restaurants as their pastry chef. And But each time I would just be sitting there rolling out my dough thinking about these stories. And so rather than write, I decided I was going to go to PSU for their uh, Ulligan Press degree as an undergraduate so I could just edit other people's work because that's <laughs> less scary still. And so I actually started in this industry after I graduated with my degree from Portland State University in arts and letters, which is a fancy way of saying I decided to take math instead of a language and then took whatever classes I wanted. So, uh, which ended up being most of Hooligan Press, which is the student run nonprofit publishing press uh, through the Portland State University. And so after I graduated, I was like, okay, I need to do something. And I found the indie publishing community through a friend of mine and realized I could be an editor 
And so I started getting clients because they were like, oh, you know what you're doing. Okay, cool. And I was like, this is awesome. It's letting me work with words and work with people's stories. And then finally my friend kind of twisted my arm enough until she was like, okay, no, you need to write your story now and get it out there. And so I kind of dabbled in historical romance at the time because it was one of those ones that I could just write, throw it out the air in the internet and then just ignore it and run away and not worry about it. And finally, I wrote this story, which is an epic fantasy, Stone and Fire, which I wrote uh, or read an excerpt from. And this is a story that I really believe in, and it's terrifying now that it's out there. So <laughs> that is my journey. Yeah, yeah and um, and that's a lot of people's like that's a lot of people's the terrified. I work with the people I work with. Are like, okay, now I want to be a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. Now what? It's it can, it's very vulnerable, but um, I wanted to ask uh, Tanya, how did you end up? So how did you overcome whatever that resistance was, and end up doing what you do? <laughs> um, so I also wrote my very first book when I was in kindergarten um, with my grandmother. Very important, uh, but. Um, I never really stopped writing from then. I know there's the very passionate um, mystery of the dead horse. Uh, the 50 cuddly bunnies and the four cute kittens, also deeply moving. <laughs> <laughs> My mother's house is completely full of books. <laughs> um, however, um, I did get a degree in creative writing, so I, I have that from the University is how I ended up out here from Southern Idaho. And uh, I I can't say exactly that there was a fear of writing and people reading it. It was more um, a fear of the industry. I did not like the traditional publishing industry. I did not like the idea of somebody telling me what my vision should be, what my words should be, what images should accompany my vision and my words. <laughs> I, I did not like the condescending, um, down your nose, you please do what I say whole thing. And one of the things that I've loved about being part of the independent uh, world is the opportunity to hear voices that you normally wouldn't hear through traditional publishing and to hear people's honest thoughts um, when they look out in the world and are trying to process um, their own thoughts and emotions and experiences. So I love independent publishing. I must because I served as the president of the Northwest Independent Writers Association for way too long. <laughs> um, you know, just to try to help other. We were having at the time when I started with them a really big problem with um, micro presses and other uh, little scam artists uh, ripping off people to the tune of like twenty thousand dollars, just cashing in on their dreams. That can make a girl pretty angry. <laughs> um, so I actually put on a symposium on how to do it yourself. And it wasn't just me personally. The organization put it on, but I, I organized it. And, and from there, I realized that I was exchanging my career for volunteer hours, and I needed to reverse that. So you now I'm back to running my own career. And my children are also publishing, and my husband is publishing, and my husband is also putting out a course online on how to publish children's books. Cause it's, very different than adult books, which is where my experience is, and the marketing of it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's basically how I do that. Um, how, um, I want to ask, we don't know anyone of you, but how did you decide um, to go indie versus traditional? And you've been doing it for a long time, but how did some of the rest of you, how did some of the rest of you decide to go indie versus traditional? Like, what was, I'm really curious about Marie's. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so from right before, well, when Scott introduced me, we talked about how I interned for an imprint of a big five, and I was very, very briefly a literary agent with uh, McGregor Literary based out in uh, Cannon Beach. And so I've always wanted to write fantasy. That is my heart when it comes to stories. The thing is, it's also the heart of probably about a million other writers, and I'm probably underestimating that. And so, 
A lot of people don't like the traditional view because they do, or the traditional publishing industry, because there is that concept of the looking down the nose, and it, there are people out there like that. And my first instinct would be like, then obviously they're not the right agent or editor for you, because if you do go traditional, there are benefits to that. They take care of stuff that you don't have to worry about, like marketing, formatting, cover design, proofing, copywriting, developing, like there is a lot. But if you have the right partner in both agent and editor, and ed a good editor, which you need to find as an independent author too, because you can't just throw a crap book out there. If you, if you put a crap book out there, you're gonna get a crap result. And so you need to still find these editors because they wanted to take their book in a different direction. And that is really what part of uh, editing and developing that you need to partner with, and I rambled enough on that tangent that, can you remember the question? Yes. <laughs> I care a lot about editing and yes. writer relations. They're very pivotal to your book and your success. So you started with, you started with, um, we we're talking about indie versus traditional, and you're saying you have to have an editor for both. Yes. But, <laughs> but you decided to go indie instead yes. of going traditional. So the reason why I decided to go indie is because so many other people want to write fantasy. So many other people want to write the speculative fiction. And so there's so much more competition. Agents are getting hundreds of emails a week. When I was doing it, I was getting 80 manuscripts a week that you would have to read, you would have to query, or you'd read the query, you would spend a lot of time with it. Most agents don't just spend like 10 seconds reading the first paragraph. Like, they actually look at your book because it could be something that they really like. Self-publishing, indie publishing, there aren't, there isn't, your competition is only other authors, and they're not even really your competition. They are just other authors, others, that you should support and they should support you. Whereas, and so basically the starting line is a lot easier to get to than in indie publishing than it is traditional publishing. And that is why I chose indie publishing, because I don't want to take 10 years to have an overnight success in traditional publishing, <laughs> Do which is the term that they use. Mm -hmm. Do any of the rest of you have any thoughts specifically about indie versus traditional, and why did you go indie instead of traditional? Brian? <laughs> um, so for, for me, uh, I grew up reading the same books that everybody else does, like the, the classic fantasies and science fiction. Fantasy and sci-fi and horror, those were my genres growing up. And uh, I've read probably thousands and thousands of books. And of those thousands and thousands of books, I've read maybe 10 that had uh, gay protagonists. Because it's a book, it, it's, a, it's a type of character that traditionally is not is not considered to be a very saleable character, and in traditional publishing, one of the things that so there's a belief that if you sometimes there is a belief that if you write a good book and you send it to a publisher, the publisher will like an editor will look through it and be like this this is a good book we should publish this, but that's not the way it works because the traditional publishing model is a business model, they have to make their money back and they spend a lot of money on, on even a book, even a book that they're taking a chance on is still bare minimum a ten to twenty thousand dollar investment just in the book, not to mention the advantage and things like that. So they have to consider what what books are marketable, what books will return that investment. And the investment that they need to return is not just to pay the author. And it's not even just to pay the staff, it's to pay the executives, it's to Pay the, uh, it's to pay 50 people who are involved in the process. So for me, because what I wanted to do was produce more fiction that had characters in it that were like me, and uh, you know, the chances of selling a book to a traditional publisher as is uh, that featured that kind of a protagonist, uh, so that somebody else out there in the world can pick up a book and 
you know, at, at 13 years old, which is the first time that I, that I found uh, other Satan's Lacking series, actually, the last Feral page, uh, has a gay protagonist. Uh, there's one of a very small minority of books like that. Uh, and that book changed my, that series changed my life. It made me feel normal. Um, and it's so rare to see those that for me, when I first started thinking, romance, you make more money as an event. That's just, it's just so much easier to make money in romance when you're, when you're, when you're self publishing. But, well, <laughs> easy. Easy. It's not easy. Uh, but there's a process. Uh, and when it comes to fantasy, though, it is really hard to sell that kind of book to a traditional publisher. Uh, there will come a day, I think one day, when we see a lot of those books become really successful with a, with a variety of really diverse protagonists. And in the last 10 years, the traditional industry has been watching the indie industry. And they've been changing how, what they accept, what they publish because we're able to put voices out there. Anyone can have their voice heard. And as we find out that like, oh wait, readers actually do want to read science fiction written, written, written by women. They actually do want to hear about, you know, protagonists of color, uh, non-gender binary protagonists, protagonists who have alternative uh, non-heterosexual sexualities. As, as our voices are heard, the traditional industry changes. And for me, I think I'll always go indie because to me it's a little bit like sort of too old to wait. I kind of feel like I can't feel like this indie the indie author community was so so supportive and so connected and so helpful to one another. Like if you wanna if you wanna write a, a book if you want and you think you might want to self-publish it, there are a there, there are, there's a legion of authors out there who are doing it successfully who will not hesitate to step in and help you produce the best book you can and then help you get it out there. And they don't care if your book is marketable and saleable or not. What they care about is that you have passion and that you're willing to do the work. And so that's what happened maybe because there's better, there's better everything. I think cookies. <laughs> she get like cider, <laughs> beverages. Um, I think it's really important, and both of you touched on that. Which, and I was going to point out, and then ask more questions. But that instead of the competition, and I'm like I'm pro indie, you guys. <laughs> but uh, instead of the competition, like you were saying, Brie, you have this cooper. I, I call it cooperative marketing because because we all know like readers as readers which we uh, all raised our hand <laughs> as readers we don't read just one book like i could read three or four books in a weekend easily like i like books better than movies i'm like if i want to relax i'm like let me go get my kindle um because i live really far away from the nearest bookstore <laughs> but uh and so i can read way faster than any writer can produce like there's no writer that can write as fast as I can read, and so there's a benefit, especially among indies, of of supporting each other. Because if I write, let's say, if I write an epic fantasy, and Brie writes an epic fantasy, and they come out at different times, or even at the same time, because I can read two books in one weekend. <laughs> you know, like we can promote each other, which I think is really great. I want to ask: Do any of the rest of you, like, do others, do Kathy or Tanya, do you have any experience with that kind of culture and well obviously if you've been Tanya, can you talk a little bit about that as the north the former north northwest, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> um, it's still around. It's not a guy. But it's uh, it was the very beginning of the indie movement. I I'm a little bit of a, a long in the tooth in the industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just always feels weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was the very beginning, and oh, our coverage were terrible. <laughs> uh, but you know, like when we started, um, it was just coming out of the oh, you vanity published, and so like you know, I would be doing signings and events, and people would open the book and they'd see the little barcode on the last page, the create space thing on it, and they'd put it back. Now we do it. We do it. My family 
he does signings twice a month to four times a month, sometimes more. And um, nobody is released the phase. They're like, oh, do you independently publish? Oh, yeah. We are on the publishing house. We only publish ourselves. Um, but um, yeah, we make very sure to be very clear that we only publish the family. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people, um, when we started, it was a very small group. We met in the pizza place across on the other side of 26. <laughs> And it was packed. <laughs> Where, like there was, there was like four or five of us. And we're like, yeah, let's get together and have this meeting. And then, boom! We're like, oh my god, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> and then it, it went on like that. There's still like 150 members in there, and you know, like the first those of us who started it, you know, we we figured out we need to build a proper team, and we helped each other find real cover designers, and we helped each other find real editors I mean, oh, the manuscripts inside those covers were even worse than the covers. But, you know, I mean, we learned, you know, that you, you do have to build a, a good, strong team, and we helped each other find those people and build the network and all the connections, and it was an awesome time to be part of the industry. Now it's more like the, the support groups are these mini corporations on Facebook. <laughs> But it's still valuable and it's still really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the things that strikes me is that anybody who's interested in reading, like, if, if there's an audience out there, regardless of the traditional publishers who are looking for a certain size audience to be able to make the money, indie authors can go find their audience. So, like, Brian can go find his audience <laughs> of people who want to read you know, other characters, other main characters, sci-fi, and you can find them and they're there because there's people who, I think about this sometimes, I think about this regularly, how many people for, you know, hundreds of years who wanted to write a book and they did and they sent it to some traditional publisher who decided it wasn't publishable <laughs> and now the world didn't get to see that book, <laughs> you know, like we don't get to see that book. Um, and I'm like I'm very excited by Cassie, who you know is writing Jane Austen. Who <laughs> has written a Jane Austen, and I'm sure there's a huge audience for that. And publishers didn't know for a long time, but I'm sure there's like plenty of like it's so exciting that now anybody who wants a little bit more can go get it. <laughs> and what so what experience have you had since um, since publishing? I'm curious about if you had any of you. Now some of you are just barely baby published. <laughs> but like what experiences have you had since um, your book came out? Um, I think imposter syndrome is really a big thing that a lot of new authors and writers, well, not, not new, but uh, people who are thinking about publishing. I think that's something we all grapple with is you know, what is this writing that I've been creating, this cathartic experience that I've been putting on paper, who wants to read that, you know? And I think the, the really positive and really cool thing about indie publishing is that it's all very personal and there's a relational experience and we've all been at that point. And, you know, like as Brian said, it's very nurturing. Um, unlike traditional publishing where, as you were saying, it's a huge investment for a corporation, it's not a big investment necessarily for an individual to put their work out there as an ebook. So there's, there's more opportunity for creative flexibility and more opportunity to experiment. And um, I think for a long time, you know, I thought about, well, I could maybe write a book, but I don't, I don't think I can handle the rejection if I send it out to all these different agents or literary critics or publishing companies and they reject it and they tear it apart. I, I can't handle that. So I think the idea of the immediacy and the lower barrier to entry for indie publishing really, um, I guess, freed up my insecurities to a certain extent where I, I felt okay about creating something and putting it out there and seeing how it did because I wasn't sending it to these people who had you know, master's degrees necessarily. I was sending it to the readers who, if they're going to have a personal experience with it and they're going to enjoy it or not. And that felt like more real feedback. It felt less um, uh, formulaic, I guess, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're writing, I feel like the 
point of it is to, to capture your own feelings and emotions in the story and then to relate to someone, have that mean something to someone. And most readers aren't going to critique a story the way that a literary critic or a book agent is going to. So having that, uh, that immediacy in publishing and getting directly to the readers, I think, really gave me that sense of freedom in, in publishing. That's awesome. Um, it makes me think oh, your analogy right there made me think of, and this is just me, you guys, <laughs> about the difference between somebody, what are those wine people called who like her? Yes, a sommelier versus somebody who just likes to drink wine. <laughs> like, and I'm not the sommelier. <laughs> I'm like, does it have dragons in it? I like it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, is it Jane Austen? Is there a Mr. Darcy? Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but you touched on a little bit, Cassie, how much it costs. And I, I'm just curious, like I know, but for the audience, like what are some of the costs, what are some of the investments that you have to make to have a quality book come out? So, would somebody like to touch on that? So, okay, so you definitely need an editor. Or self-publishers don't have the budget that traditional houses can afford. So the prices tend to be much cheaper. However, the quality isn't actually nearly, like if the quality isn't less than the traditional publishing. And a lot of traditional publishers actually freelance and contract out their editors as well. So you could be using someone who also works for a big five, but they need more clients and so they're also offering their services at a lower rate because indie authors can only afford the lower rate. For just a standard book or with no marketing, you're already looking at $500 to $600. And so you need to be willing to invest that if you want to see really any money come back because there are so many self-published books now that you can't just throw one out there and people are going to find it. That's, that's not how it works anymore. Maybe when it first started 10 years ago, there were less competition and readers were more likely to stumble upon your book. Nowadays, Amazon's having hundreds of thousands of books across all genres published every single day. So you need to be willing to up the game and do the work that traditional publishers would do for you to get your, uh, get your book seen. So not only is there a monetary value and monetary investment, there's a big time investment that you have to add to it. Yeah. I like to, I want to put that in context though, because a lot of context is, you know, how much it used to be, and by used to be, as an indie, it's like five or six years ago. <laughs> it's not like decades ago. For, I personally, I think, you know, a, with a thousand dollars, you can make a really, really good, like you can have the, the good quality of all the things. But if you're a DIY person, which a lot of people are, you can do it for significantly less. Yeah. Um, Don't skip yes, ahead of Cassie. I will say that depending on the genre, it is you're talking about, there are some genres where it's a thousand dollars a day or more to market and advertise. If you choose your genre wisely and then incorporate the thoughts and ideas that you had about your story um, within, within that framework, you can still be successful without having to invest, you know, a thousand dollars into a book. For instance, <laughs> this book cost me approximately seventy dollars to write. You know, that, that's my subscription to InDesign, which I'll never use again. But <laughs> that's all of that. I didn't. I didn't hire an editor. I went through and did like four passes of editing myself. So they met the caveat there. You have to. You know, I guess have that one the knowledge and then two the confidence to be able to do it yourself. But I will say that in terms of a return, I vastly exceeded what I thought I would make on it. Um, and it's what to me seemed like an experiment. I'm just going to test the waters and see if I can put something out there and earn back what I put into it. If I make what I what I invested, then I'm happy. Turned into something where I thought, okay, I can actually make a living off of this. So it really, it's really important to choose a genre wisely and not something necessarily that's just popular because the popular genres are the ones that have authors sinking tons of money into it. So, so do your research, I guess is what I'm trying to say too. Yeah. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? 
Brian? I think <clears throat> I think I can say that I represent sometimes the uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, the wonderful thing about the indie industry and our and the infrastructure that we've built over the past decade or so since we just sort of got started um, is that if you are fresh into it and you don't have the capital to invest, there is a network there that will support you. You can find someone. You don't necessarily have to edit your own book. You can find someone that you can trade with if you're if you're if you're competent and you're familiar with with how to edit text and that sort of thing. You have attention to detail. Whatever your skills are, there are authors out there who are willing to work with you to trade with you so that so that everyone's voice gets to be heard and lifted up. Um, we at this point have attracted. We attra our industry has attracted. Professional editors from big houses who are, who frankly aren't making enough from traditional editor from traditional publishing houses, and we have enough successful indie authors at this point that we can sometimes pay them more than than what the traditional houses do. We've got the cover artists who used to only work with uh, Bain and Tor and the, the big the big fantasy production houses that uh, that you've seen that like beautiful illustrated covers and recently big photoshopped covers and things like that. We've attracted those people as well because there's more of us. There are more indie authors out here. Uh, so they get more work instead of having to, you know, take some work from a, a, a publishing house every, you know, once a month or something like that. Instead now, I mean, they can booked up working between traditional and, and indie publishers. So on the one hand, if you are just starting out and you don't have anything to really invest in a book, that's okay. There's a network of authors out there that can help support you for that. If you've been doing it a little while, or if you are retired, or you're coming from another career, you're trying to get out of tech support, uh, which I was when I first started, um, then you can then you can invest in professionals uh, who will charge sometimes a little bit more, whether it's whether it's warranted or not, but you can you can invest in the, in the professionals that match what it is that you want. That wasn't the case ten years ago when indie publishing first started out. You would be hard pressed to invest ten thousand dollars into the production of a book because there wasn't anyone out there who was working with indies. Now you can find the editors who are willing to edit your book for you know point oh three cents a word, or you can find the editors who will take you through the full process, the same treatment that a traditional book gets, where there's a developmental stage, there's a copy stage, there's a proofreading stage. Um, you, can, you can put your book through the same process that a traditional publisher would put it through. Uh, the only question is whether or not at the end of that journey, whether the reader cares or not. <laughs> And a lot of the time, they don't. Like readers, and, and I mean, maybe some of you can agree. Uh, readers, at the end of the day, just want a good story. They just want good characters. They just want a break. You know, they just uh, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily need to know that their wine was buried in a dark hole for fifty years and prayed over by monks. Like it doesn't make it taste more like wine. <laughs> Um, uh, and that's one of the things that we're sort of learning is what exactly is it that readers want? Like, they just want they just want good stories. They don't need they don't necessarily want production values. It's not a Michael Bay movie, you know. It's just a good story. And sometimes a good story will just take off, even if it's really poorly edited, even if it has a terrible cover. Somewhere out there, there's an audience for it, and if those people are vocal, then off it goes. That happens. Like, I've talked to authors that that happens to. Because yeah. <laughs> it is. People just want a good story if you can tell a good story. Um, I'm curious, do any of you have thoughts about where you guys are going as authors, as indies, and where the industry might be going as indies, or what are you excited about as indies in the future? Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
One of the things that I'm really excited about is the variety, and I think I sort of touched on this before, I'm excited about the variety of voices that are now being heard. Because uh, for a really long time, traditional publishers have controlled, it, it, it's a sort of a feedback loop. They know what sells, because they can, they can look at their, at their book sales, and they know that in fantasy, uh, uh, the orphan farm boy with a magic sword sells really well. So there are a hundred books out there, and it gets hot. And, uh, when Harry Potter came out, we immediately saw so many books about a young orphan wizard going to wizard school of some variety. And it's because those things those things do happen. A lot of readers, they find a book that they like, and then they go out and immediately try to find a book kind of, kind of like that. If you like dragons, you go out and you find another book that's got dragons, of course. <laughs> yes. um, and because of that, there is this sort of closed loop where they take chances. Traditional publishers have always taken chances on new authors with new voices and things like that. But they have to have big hits to subsidize those voices. Uh, if there's not a J.K. Rowling, then there won't be this other small author who published a book uh, through you know, whatever publisher, uh, through, this, through the same publisher, it maybe wasn't as successful, but they wanted to take a chance on it because they could afford to, because they just made a billion dollars off of Harry Potter. Now that there is this huge indie publishing industry, and and now that it has evolved like it has, so that there are some really quality, there are indie books out there now that if you saw them on the bookshelf, you couldn't tell the difference. You don't, you, you wouldn't know that they were indie published or trade published. Um, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't know the difference. You should just enjoy the book that you pick up. Uh, but now that there is this wave of new voices and new stories and things that traditional publishers may in the past have not really quite wanted to take a chance off, uh, a chance on that has impacted significantly the way that traditional publishers think. They watch. They watch the book market. They watch the whole book market, not just the trade market. They watch the indie market as well. And if they see that something is gaining ground, then they start looking for those manuscripts. And self-publishing is a lot of hard work. It's not for everyone. Uh, it's it's not just. It's not something you do casually necessarily. Uh, because it becomes a, it very quickly becomes a full-time job. It becomes a hundred-hour-a-week job very, very quickly, uh, especially if you get to be successful. Uh, it's not right for everyone, and now that the indie market is sort of the, has become the forerunner, we're the experimenters. Uh, we have really fast ships that are individual and we can turn really fast versus the big mega corporations that publish books. It takes them a long time to adapt. Now they can just watch what we do. And if it looks like there is a sudden interest in diverse voices, trade publishers, they start combing their stats and they start looking for those diverse voices. So I think that in the next 10 years, we're going to see a huge shift in the trade publishers and who they'll take and what they'll publish and what sorts of stories we're going to see because of that. Because we're the, we're the people out in front who are testing the market and taking the losses sometimes to find out what it is that readers are willing to read, what they love and what they're hungry for. Uh, and that's going to open the door to a lot of writers who want to go trade, who want to go into traditional publishing. There have been 50 indie authors with a, a voice kind of like theirs, and now the door is open to those trade publishers. So I think it really is a, it's a, it's a tide that floats all boats, whether they're speedboats or battleships. But your royalties aren't going to be as good. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I'm kind of going to piggyback off of Brian. Um, yes, traditional publishing does look at those. Like if we look at Tor.com, it's a new imprint of Tor, which is a major fantasy publisher. They specifically do ebooks only, and they're, they just started to branch out into print. But they also do what Indie publishing considers full-length novels at 50,000 words as novellas. If traditional books, if you're writing less than 100,000 words, which is about a 350, 375 what, Microsoft Word page document, they're not going to look at you. They're like, what? You can't tell a story in 50,000 words. 
But indie publishing has shown that you can tell a story that readers want to read in that length. So that helps there. And so yes, the trade industry is seeing that we do want more diverse uh, voices and they are slowly turning that ship. But with Amazon, you can make six figures. I know an author who is making seven figures. He works 40 hours a week. He's gotten to that point. He invests hundreds of thousands of dollars and he, he treats it as a job because that's what it is. If you want to be successful as an indie author, you have to realize it is a career. This is a job. The only reason why I was able to be successful with this is because I went on maternity leave and my husband has a really great job that allowed me to jump into this abyss that I have no idea if I'm going to screw it up or not. <laughs> and so I had a safety net. And if you don't have that safety net, some people really do well with that risk. And other people, it keeps them from jumping. And so knowing that the industry can change any day and you have no idea what that is going to be is scary. Yeah, there's, there's two sides to that, not knowing what it's going to change because it's not just Amazon, it's all the readers, there's trends all over the place, and, but the other side is you can follow them as quickly as, like, because you get to write, you know, so quickly because you get to release, you don't have to wait two years, you can follow those trends really quickly. Um, I, 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 have, I have a book, which I don't need, like, <laughs> I'm not trying to, but I, I have a book about marketing, and you don't, you have to rely on Amazon, because that's who you sell through, but you get to develop your own relationships with readers, independent of Amazon, and you can build all your, that's, that part I think is so exciting. I remember when I was a kid, and I would read a book that I really loved, and I'm like, I want to write to the author, <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, okay, how do I find their address? <laughs> you know, and you're like, the only address is New York, New York. <laughs> you know? Like, this is the only address there is. I hope they get it. <laughs> you know, like, like, you never really knew if they ever actually got the letter, right? And, and now you can go to Twitter, you can go to Facebook, and you're like, I loved your book. And they're like, awesome. I'm so excited, you know, like immediate feedback. You get to have that interaction with your readers and build that relationship on a personal level. Like some of the people that I've interviewed, um, one of the gentlemen I interviewed, he writes science fiction, military sci-fi, and he had a, the story made me cry. So that was Jonathan Brazy, and he, he was a military guy and he had military folk reading his books. And one of them, was like a big fan. They, they started this email relationship back and forth. He ended up naming one of his characters after the guy, after the reader, and then um, and then after you know back and after a little while, after about three years of this interaction back and forth emailing, he noticed that he like left his email, like he left his email subscription. He's, he got off the newsletter and he's like, hey, you know, hey, what happened? You know, like I haven't heard from you in a while. And it turned out he passed away. He'd been sick. Like he'd been in bed, like he'd had like he was like paralyzed in bed. He and the Jonathan never knew that he was paralyzed in bed. He just thought, oh, this fan. And the family actually invited him to come to the funeral. And they were like, You have no idea the impact that you had. Because you put him in your book because he was like, Hey, this is me. He was reading your stories and like totally transformed the last few years of his life. They invited him, like they, he spoke at the, it was just, I cried as I was telling him this word, like, you know, because, because he got to have that relationship with a fan that just, that I, I never had that when I was trying to email, <laughs> when I was trying to write letters to folk back in the day. I'm like, I hope they get this, so that, that really excites me. And I, um, I, and I know you guys, some of these are a little bit newer, but I'm sure that you guys will have those experiences. As because one of the other authors that I interviewed, she has a son with autism, and so she writes romance novels, but she puts you know she puts little characters in that have a little bit of autism, and and the the responses that she gets from people are just amazing because you don't see those kind of characters in books very often. And so it's this really, really beautiful thing. I, I have dozens of stories, so I'm not gonna go <laughs> on all the stories, but it's just, 
one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to be in this industry and why I will drive 10 hours <laughs> to come hang out with other indie authors <laughs> and my sister <laughs> who is also an author. So uh, it just is really exciting. Um, and I really appreciate you guys being here. I appreciate you guys and the input that you had and the sharing your stories. They were amazing. I think, I hope I was very excited because you can hear the quality of the writing in their, you know, in their blurbs, whatever, in their readings. You can hear the quality. You're like, oh, that's not, you, know, you can hear it. It's really exciting. And I appreciate the courage that it takes to be a writer and to share it with everybody out here, you know, to stand up, but even just to put it for sale and share that bit of your heart with all of us. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. Hey boss, you made it to the end of the episode. You're the best. Because of that, I'm going to give you a special invitation to find out more about the Author Boss Academy, where I and a bunch of really awesome authors hang out, have fun, and get stuff done. If you end up joining, tell me the secret word and you'll get a special bonus. Find out more about the Academy at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash Academy. The secret word is nipples. <laughs> hugs and happy authoring. I hope to see you soon. If you love the Author Like a Boss podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time.